So I'll start things off. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Nanak. This is the music mixing masterclass at QWave. I'm glad to be uh, back on campus in the most virtual way possible uh, from my studio. Uh, I spent all last year at Queens uh, for the MBA program. Just wrapped that up. So I'm a, I'm very excited to be here. Should be pretty fun. So let's kick things off and let's let's look at you know what am I even going to talk about today. So I'm going to start it off by thinking about who am I. Then I'm going to get into what is the point of mixing. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the main components of mixing, uh, going into in particular vocal mixing, because I find like that is the most difficult part of mixing usually. And we're going to go into a live demonstration and then we're going to have some extended Q&A at the end. So let's talk about me a little bit, just to give a little introduction on who I am. So my name is Nanak. I go by the moniker So Divine. I'm a music producer and composer. I've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, I've done a bunch of films, some singles, some EPs, so 15 films. Uh, I am a Bell Media Television composer. So right now I'm writing music for Bell TV, which is CTV, TSN, um, some of the broadcast TV. I'm an engineer, went to the University of Calgary and, and Queens, of course, and I did DSP engineering at General Dynamics after I graduated from my undergrad. And DSP is basically all the signal processing that happens on the back end. Uh, I was doing it for radios, but it's the same theory when it comes to music production. So you might, I'm, I, I made this masterclass as, as uh, low on the tech as possible. So I'm not gonna be going straight into like bits and bytes, but uh, if you have any questions around that, we can discuss that. So let's talk about what is mixing. What's the point? Um, here's my definition. So to understand mixing, you have to understand what a record is. So a record is just a collection of instruments and vocals combined together. So combined, that's the mixing part, combining them together to create a complete piece of work. And that combination is where mixing comes in. So mixing is not involved in, you know, writing music or singing it, performing it. It's, it's the art of putting it together. And you want to put it together in a way that's the most sonically pleasing. And that's where human perception comes in. That's where a lot of theory and uh, a lot of science meets uh, the arts because it's, it's an art, right? What sounds good to you might not sound good to someone else, but there's some best practices we can, we can uphold that will make sure that it sounds as good as it possibly can. I hope that's clear. So it's, it's different than, than broadcasting. It's, it's just the art of putting things together. Now, when we're putting things together, there's really three tools that we have at our disposal. So the three things that we have, three categories of things that we have. So the first thing is volume based mixing, which is dynamics. So how loud is one instrument with respect to some other instrument or how loud are the vocals with respect to the drums, for example, the second component is the frequency. So it's, and I'll, I'll talk about this more. It's, it's which frequencies are each components taking up. So the bass is going to take up the low frequencies and, and the hi hats might take up the high frequencies, but it's, it's good to be aware of these things. And the last part is a stereo image, which is where are you placing each thing in respect to left and right? So I like to call this VFS. So uh, volume frequency stereo. Just remember that whenever you're going in to mix anything, those are the three things in order that you have to remember. So volume, how loud is it? Frequency, where is it? And stereo image, where is it from left to right? And I'm gonna go into detail on these things just in a second. So I wanna take a second to talk about human hearing. So what is the range of human hearing? Humans can hear frequencies from 20, fre 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 hertz. And that's basically your canvas. So as a mixing engineer or a, or a singer or a songwriter, that is your canvas. That's, those are all the frequencies that humans can hear. And on this chart, you can see, oh, there's different parts of the frequency range. Like there's the high end, the high mids, the mid range, the low mids, the low end. It's just good to know that different instruments are going to occupy different parts of this frequency range. And you have to be careful when you're putting things on top of other things, 
within each frequency range. I'm going to pause for a second here. Does anybody have any outstanding questions or anything that they're like, man, this is going too fast. What's a frequency? What's going on? Are we good to go? Chat looks good. I think we're good. Good. Okay. Let's keep going. So here's something that I'm going to, I'm going to explain. This is one kiss by Calvin Harris. I'm sure you guys have heard that song. Very, very famous song. And on this graph, you can see the frequency, the stereo image and the volume. So you, you, you get to see VFS on this right away. The volume is referring to how each item is stacked on top of the other item. So in this case, you're seeing like the brass is louder than the strings, the piano and the main synth. The snare is technically louder than the vocals in this area. The kick is, is looks like the loudest thing in the track almost. That, that's the V part. The frequency is on the Y axis. So you can see it goes from 20 Hertz, which is down here all the way to 20,000 Hertz, the entire human spectrum. And then you've got the S, the stereo image left and right. It's really useful to look at uh, mixing from this perspective, because what you see is you see that each and every instrument is occupying a distinct spot within this area. It's really important that you've got these distinct areas that are occupied by distinct things. Because if you try to stack too many things um, at the exact same spot, let's say we put the brass right on top of the vocals, and let's say we put the strings right on top of the vocals, and we put the piano right on top of the vocals, right in the middle, well, guess what? Everything is in the same spot and you're not gonna be able to distinguish each and every item from, from other parts. Uh, looks like we got a question, is that right? Uh, I don't know if it was a question, more so a comment by Ibrahim. He had mentioned that, um, and I was thinking this too, so it's very cool that you brought it up. Um, I would say that, you know, obviously stereo image, so left, right is very important and is the main proponent here, but um, it should also be mentioned. I feel like sometimes there is an essence especially in a lot of ambient or soundscape or cinematic stuff, you'll have like top and bottom. So X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, and that is, there are a lot of plugins that could accomplish that too. I find I, I like to use them uh, personally. Totally. Yeah. Just something that I that's can... a great observation. I was, that's, that's even a level deeper than, than what I was going to cover today, but you're absolutely right. There are, there's things like the Haas effect. There's things that you can put up and down, but I wanted to stick to the fundamentals here, which are, <clears throat> you've got the left and right, you're placing things in the mix, but you notice how the strings are on the left and the right, and they're they're mirrored down the middle, right? Um, that's basically what the Haas effect does. Uh, and we can talk about that more right after the class or if you got any more specific questions. But what I wanted to illustrate with this slide is that each part, each instrument and each part of the mix has its own spot. It roughly has its own area. And they're trying to minimize the overlap as much as you can. Now let's get into mixing vocals and vocals are on this record right in the middle here on one kiss, for example. And when you're mixing vocals, uh, the three things that I'm going to talk about today are mic placement. Firstly, how the heck do you record good vocal? I never want to have you guys in a spot where you've got this vocal stem already and it's terrible and doesn't sound good. And now you have to <laughs> now you have to repair it. That's, that's the worst spot that you can possibly be in. So recording vocals well and recording them properly. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is vocal placement within the mix. And that goes back to that chart that we were looking at, um, how vocals are placed, not just one layer, but multiple layers. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about before we get into some live uh, logic demo is some tools available to make the vocals sound great. And we're gonna look at that VFS model and we're gonna look at, okay, volume tools, frequency tools, and stereo tools. So mic placement. Here's a, here's a guy with a mullet standing in front of a microphone. Um, the best mic placement for vocals are eight to 12 inches away from, from the tip of your lips to the front of the microphone. And the closer you get to the microphone, the more bassy your voice is going to be. Um, 
that can be good or bad. Depends on the kind of track that you're trying to record. I would basically never be any closer than six inches from the microphone because that is just, uh, you're gonna get a lot of low frequency muddle that you just don't want in your recording. It's not gonna sound natural. You wanna be aligned directly with the mic as best you can, or you can be very slightly off axis. And the reason you might be slightly off axis is to catch um, and avoid what are called plosives. Uh, a plosive is basically when, so whenever you speak a word that starts with the letter P or B, um, if you put your hand in front of your, um, in front of your mouth and you, and you say P or B, you're gonna feel this, this puff of air coming from your mouth hitting your hand. That's a plosive and that is gonna hit the mic and it's gonna distort whatever your, whatever your singer is singing. So you wanna, you can place the mic slightly off axis to avoid that puff of air or you can use a pop filter. I know there's a question here about uh, that a sock works as a pop filter. Uh, really any air permeable fabric will do it if you're being completely you know, scientific about it. Um, the one thing with a sock is if it's super thick, it can actually end up absorbing some of the frequencies, which is what you don't want. So if, if you're going to get a muddled recording, if you use a really thick sock, so you try to use like very thin nylon, uh, that's not going to absorb any, any frequencies. If you, if you can, that's, that's the best that you can get. There's a, there's products on the market that allow you to shield audio, um, shield reflections from the mic. So if we're looking at some of these products, Here's some products. So this is the Chaotica eyeball. It's like a big puff that goes around your microphone. It's gonna avoid other other sounds from hitting the mic. Only your voice will do it. There's a mic shield here. There's another kind of foamy product. And my favorite, the one on top, which is simply just uh, a part of your home or a part of your room, like a closet, that is just naturally absorbing sound. So a closet, like a, if you have a walk-in closet, that's gonna be better than than like any a recording environment that you can produce with a mic shield or a or a foamy uh, mic cover. So if you got a walk-in closet, or if you got even like a closet in the background, um, that can be really effective. So question here: Is there a difference between a foam cover versus a pop filter? Yes. So what a foam cover is doing is it's blocking other sounds from coming into your recording, and what a pop filter is doing is it's avoiding the plosives um, from hitting your microphone and distorting. I hope that makes sense. So the best recording you can get is a combination of both. So like something like the eyeball, or if you're in a closet with a, with a pop filter, that'd be great. Um, another question here, hey, Brian. So depending on where you set the mic relative to your angle, will you get a slightly different tone for your voice? Setting the mic higher than you or setting the mic lower than you? Yes, you will. You definitely will. It really depends on the type of singer. So a lot of rap vocals are recorded really, really close. So they'd be like eight inches, super close, like right in the middle. Um, and you might want different different genres of music. Like let's say you have a guitarist and you might want to mic them slightly further. So you pick up some of the guitar, you pick up some of the room. So it, that's where the artistic kind of elements come into play. Um, Generally, the closer the mic is to the person, the more bassy it's going to sound. And the further the mic is from the person, the more airy it's going to sound and the more of the room you're going to pick up. I hope that makes sense. So now let's look at where to place vocals in a mix. Where should it be in the mix? This is a rock song. I'm not sure which song this is. It's the same example, same type of example that you can see from... Um, from the One Kiss Calvin Harris record. But as you can tell, there's a lot going on here and we've got the vocals in the middle. And at the same time, we've got these other things called backing vocals that are sitting left and right. And backing vocals are provided to support the main vocal sound. The reason why vocals are so important is because usually that's your that's the messenger on your song. That's the voice that's um, talking about the lyrics. It's talking about the emotion. It's telling the story. So it's really important that you've got that voice right in the middle and you've got the backing vocals supporting it. One thing I wanted to mention here 
in this frequency range that's going from 250 hertz all the way to 10,000 hertz, look at all the instruments that you have in this frequency range. So you've got the rhythm guitar, you've got some of the bass, you've got some of the kick, you've got the backing vocals, you've got the high tom, you've got the lead guitar, synths, and then you've got the main vocals, and you've got the snare. There's a lot going on in that frequency range. So it's very important that you use that VFS methodology to make sure that everything can have its own spot. If it doesn't have its own spot, you're gonna have a lot of things just on top of each other um, that will basically just muddle muddle the whole thing up. The question here, uh, what are overheads? So an overhead, because this, this record is a rock record, an overhead would be microphones that are recorded on top of the drum set. Um, those microphones will be picking up all the cymbals. So really, really high frequency stuff, like, you know, crash cymbal, um, ride cymbals, different types of crash cymbals. And those would be right on the top, of course, because they're higher frequencies. I wanted to just pause here. Does this make sense? We're looking at an entire record here. We've got all these different elements of it. Um, have I lost anybody? Is, every, any, is anyone like, why is this guy showing me another graph? <laughs> sure, I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so what's the difference between like the synths being on the far left and right versus like, what would that sound like with the vocals being in the middle? That's a great question. So if we put the synths one and two right in the middle with the vocals, is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you can definitely, nothing is stopping you from putting them on top of the vocals, but what's going to happen is you're going to cover up the vocals and you're going to cover up the synths. So it's kind of like, uh, Think of it like you're making a you're making a painting, right? And if you put three things on top of each other, well, now you've got all this paint that's like muddled up. Um, there's no clarity. You can't really tell the details. It just makes it sound not as good, and it makes it sound incoherent because now you got like three things coming at the same spot, uh, all talking over each other. It would be it's kind of like if you're in a <clears throat> If you're if you're in a crowded room and there's 10 people talking to you at the same time and you're kind of like man I, I can only I, I only want to pay attention to one thing at one time and I should know where to go to get that one thing if it's all on top of itself that's what's gonna cause it to be muddled and and not pleasing does that answer the question for sure man thanks dude yeah do you, do you okay. mind if I uh uh, no, Mac, do you mind if I just like sort of follow up on that, like sort of add something that I'm not sure if um, oh. if it might help, but because um, the way I see it and like this is coming from like um, sort of like a really scientific view and it helps me sort of uh, because that's like sort of my background and what I'm studying now, uh, it helps me like, you know, lift the veil on some of this stuff. It can get really complicated when you look at it. Um, the 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 unifying aspect of everything you see here is the fact that at the end of the day, these are all frequencies. So the only thing differentiating you hearing a 500 Hertz in a vocal coming from a vocal and 500 Hertz coming from a synth is the idea that you can move them in a stereo field. Right. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, look like obviously um, like there's, there's timbre and there's tone and, and, and obviously 500 Hertz from a guitar will not sound the same as 500 Hertz from a vocal, but when you really get down to the nitty gritty, 500 Hertz is 500 Hertz. Right. And that's how I like to see it. So you, I feel like, and I, I could be, I could be wrong here, but I feel like the way I see it is that like, um, when you get that overlap, it, it is important to, to, to widen it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And the, a good thing to think about it is that VFS again, the, the three ways that you can make things stand apart. Volume, make one louder than the other. Frequency, shift sure. it around, put it in a different spot. And S, stereo, that's what that's what Adam was talking about. Different parts of the stereo field. If you use that VFS in that order, your mixes should never sound muddled. Just make sure you use it and make sure you put them in, in their distinct spots. So I'll carry on here if that's uh, if that's good with you, Vincent. I hope that was insightful. Yeah, appreciate that, guys. Perfect. So let's break that VFS down even more. So what tools do we really have <laughs> to make your vocal sound good? So you've got this amazing singer. You've got Ariana Grande in your in your studio. She's recorded this amazing take. Now what do you do? So this VFS model. 
we've got some tools available to us that can make things sound better. So under volume, we've got dynamic processing, which are which is a compressor or gain staging. That's really uh, at the high level. That's really all you have. Um, I'll go into detail on these in a second. In the frequency area, again, at a high level, the, the few tools you have are equalization and saturation. I'll talk about those in a second as well. And in stereo image, what you've got is stereo placement. Where are you putting things? And then some other effects like reverb, delay, Haas effect, um, flangers. There's, there's a ton of stuff you can do that's creative uh, that we'll get into in a second. I wanted to take a second and just touch on what the heck is a, comp a compressor? <laughs> There's so much uh, confusion around what a compressor really is. Uh, it, it doesn't make your file size smaller. I know a lot of people think that's what a compressor is. No, it's not a file compressor. This is an audio compressor. And really what it is in its essence, it is an automated volume knob. All it does is it turns down the volume when it when the audio is too loud that's it there's nothing crazy there's no like voodoo here there's no magic compressor it's just turning down the volume that's all it's doing so over here you can see um here's an uncompressed signal this part is really loud what's going to happen is when you try to mix this that loud part is going to stick out of the mix and you're going to be like oh man that is way too loud and you're going to turn it down and then suddenly this part's really quiet and you're going to be like, man, that's too quiet. I got to turn it back up. And you're going to keep fighting it to try to find the right spot so that you can actually hear everything. What a compressor will do is it will turn down the volume when things are too loud, as I said. So you set a threshold usually, and when the audio is too loud, it'll squash it down. So then you have something that's more consistent like you can see here way more consistent and it's way easier to mix this because it doesn't flop around everywhere it's not like suddenly too loud or too quiet it's a really great tool that comes under the v category in the vfs the volume category once you've got everything nice and compressed like how you want it then you can gain stage it you can say okay i want the vocals to be louder i want them to be softer i want the guitars to be louder uh, and then of course the s at the end there I'm gonna lay things out here really simply. I know I was talking with some of the Q-Wave people and they were saying that, you know, vocal mixing, what's the approach? Like, how should I approach it? This is the approach. <laughs> and it's really simple. It's got five steps to it. The first step, clean your vocals, get rid of, you know, if you've got a dog barking in the background or something, cut that part out. If you've got these weird rumbles, you can, you can treat it. Next, you wanna put it into any kind of pitch correction if you want to, which is auto-tune, that kind of stuff. And then VFS, volume, frequency, stereo. Anybody have any questions around this approach? Anyone like, what is pitch correction? We're good to go. Okay, I'll keep going here. So let me now open up an actual project and show you guys this VFX, VF, VFX, VFS in, in action here. So what I'm gonna do is just share my screen. One second here. Really love the way you explain compression, by the way. It's good stuff. I've always, uh, it's so funny. You look everywhere and you look for like all these, especially when you're starting out, you're looking for all these like magic explanations and people are giving all these like really complicated like, D details of like what everything does so definitely a good uh good way to describe it <clears throat> getting straight to the point yeah I'm, I'm glad i'm glad it was effective i've just um i've just flipped around in my studio so that now i can actually use my monitors while i'm going through this um also one says explain HPF. Yes, I will explain that. What that sound, what that stands for is a high pass filter. Um, and I am going to just go actually go through it and show you um, what that does. Really great tool. So I'm going to share my screen here. Can anybody, everybody see this? Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. Um, okay, perfect. I'm just going to test the audio one second here. Yeah, yeah, we're good. 
Okay, perfect. So why don't I do this? Let me just play this record for you. This is a brand new record. It's not out yet. Um, I wanted to show you guys this record because it does a good job explaining the different vocal elements that we've talked about already. Um, this particular record is, um, yeah, sneak peek, exactly. It's going to be coming out in March, uh, March 9th, but I thought I'd, I'd uh, do something special for you guys. So let's check it out. I'm going to play the record and then we're going to talk about it after. Thanks everyone for the, <laughs> I was reading the chat. I uh, appreciate it. I'm glad that the vocals um, were cutting through and even on Zoom, like it's it's just, I was afraid that the quality might be, you know, all over the place, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it's coming through. So let's get into, um, let's get into the actual nitty gritty here on the mix. And I want to talk about that VFS approach, of course, um, and different ways that the vocals have been put together. Before I get into that, though, th did anybody have any like particular questions that we could cover right now on some of the things that you're seeing, uh, or is everyone understanding what just happened in this in this program? I think we're good. I think we're so. good. Okay. I just thought I'd check in because not everyone is familiar with with like what this even is like is this a what software it is and how it works yeah I mean like maybe that. like maybe we could do like a quick like quick introduction like quick just like setting the stage setting sure those, but. yeah let me just take like a minute um, basically this program is called logic it is a DAW which is a digital audio workstation um, on the left hand side you can see I've, I've labeled all the different 
um, instruments that are playing. And on each instrument, on the left hand side, you see all the effects on that instrument, different things I've added. Um, and we're going to get into that, uh, particularly what we've put on the vocals. And um, also talking about the master chain, which is right here, the stereo out. I know there's a question on like what mastering is and what, what the point of it is. And I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. But basically, as this um, marker goes through the record, it's playing all the instruments that it's hitting. So what I can do here is let me just, uh, if I press this S button, I can solo what, what this layer is. So this particular layer is, is a piano layer, a Rhodes piano layer. So let's have a listen to it. So that's the just the roads by itself, right? And as I as I solo other things, I can we can start combining things. So let me solo the second roads layer on top of that just to show you. So that's the that's the second piano rail. That, that that's actually a real roads. Uh, it's not synthesized. <laughs> we had a real roads piano. Um, let me add the bass layer on it now. explains you know how um <laughs> the chat's going crazy right now but i i could i hope that explains like how these pieces come together and and sound good or, or sound bad um i hope that yeah i hope that did a good job of doing that let me talk more about the vocals so let me show you the vfs approach in action here just to make sure that it makes sense um <laughs> Lots of questions like how did the bass um, end up so smooth? I'll talk about that as well at the end here. Let's have a look at the vocals. Let me um, let me just play uh, this part of the song here, which is the first verse. The vocals are going to be playing from this particular spot here, so it's under main vocals, Celsi, who is who's my collaborator on the song. Let me just solo her vocals here, so. Summer was hot You held me in the easy breeze We got it on Sounds great. But that's with all the effects and everything on it. So let me just take all the effects off. Let's just look at the raw, like, what it sounded like just coming out of the microphone. Um, nothing in front of it. Here. So I'm going to turn all these off. I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to turn the reverb off. So this is like as raw it comes, as it comes. Summer was hot. You held me in the easy breeze. We got it on. Now I'm just going to illustrate the approach that we had. So the approach was clean the vocals, pitch correction, and then VFS, volume, frequency, stereo, right? So let's clean the vocals. And I know there was a question about like, what's HPF? What that's called is a high pass filter. And that's, that's the first thing I'm gonna put on here. So this channel EQ, this is a high pass filter. It's putting, it's basically getting rid of all the frequencies under this spot. What this does is like any, um, yeah, yeah, basically passes the highs and mutes the lows. What happens is a lot of the times when you're recording, there might be like a rumble in the microphone cable or like some kind of rumble in the stand and that gets picked up on the mic and ends up in your mix. So like, just get rid of all that stuff. So if I listen to the vocals here, let me just play them from here. What you'll see is you'll see some activity in this area. That's Celsius vocal recording. Right here, you see that? Summer 
That's her vocal recording. You held me in the easy so we've got rid of all of those lows, like just in case there's something in there. <clears throat> there isn't really in this case because it was recorded in a really nice environment. Um, with with a great microphone so that we didn't really get any rumble there but just in case we get rid of that next thing you want to do is just go through and see if you want to get rid of like any breaths or any like weird things so i put this gain um on there and i just went through like this particular you know part was sung very very um there was some background stuff going on there so i just turned that down 10 db you can't even hear it when you listen to it so you held me in the So like right there, you kind of heard a duck. That's getting rid of just on the high level, some of the stuff. Um, here's what it's saying. Uh, Brandon's asking, so it's like a compressor, but for frequencies instead of volume. Um, it's, it's, it's less like a compressor because it's not an automated volume knob. It's just a static volume knob. It's just cutting it completely for the whole track. There's no low frequencies on the vocals because you know, Celsius' voice doesn't even hit like 100 hertz and things like that. I hope that answers the question, Brandon. Yeah, it does. Yeah? Okay, perfect. So once you've kind of cleaned up the record, <clears throat> you've put that high pass filter on there, got rid of all the gunk. The next thing usually is some kind of pitch correction. So over here, I've used waves. I really like waves, uh, but there's no reason that you have to use waves. You can use like the inbuilt. Uh, pitch correction and logic you can use auto-tune it's it's good to have that on because when you're in a professional kind of mix environment literally anything that's even slightly off is just amplified so unless you've got um, a particular style of music that you don't want to use any pitch correction if you want to use pitch correction that's the time i use just a little bit to make this sound a little electronic but yeah, you, you definitely don't have to use it. Yeah, auto-tune is, is a great example. So I put that pitch correction on. The main thing about, I'm just gonna cover what pitch correction does. It will, it will basically detect what pitch um, your singer is hitting and it will try to put it to the closest correct pitch. So this track is in C natural minor. So that's the, that's the scale I selected. And you don't want to crank the pitch correction too much because then you end up sounding like a, like a computer. Like I'll show you what that sounds like here. So if I crank Summer this, she's gonna sound like that. Like if I just go like. You held me in the easy breeze. We like, you got know, it sounds like T-Pain or, or unless that's like the effect that you're going for. Um, I probably, yeah, it's like Daft Punk. Um, you don't necessarily want to crank that if you don't want to. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're making a joke here about the chopping it up. Yeah, I mean, people do all sorts of crazy stuff on that front. Anyway, hey, Donna, yeah, go ahead. Would this work for other live instruments as well? Like, let's say, for example, strings where sometimes yeah, intonation is an issue? Definitely, you can. You definitely can. And I'm not sure if the Waves one does it. It's got these, like, different ranges. I think the waves pitch correction is more around vocals, but I'm wondering, I think like the logic pitch correction does have an instrument mode. Um, oh yeah, so it's just got the normal or the low end instrument mode. There are some advanced pitch correction things that will do like instruments as well. It's it's really, really interesting. And for strings, I'm sure there, if you try to string, it would probably work. And we can talk about that more as well. So coming back to the thing, clean the vocals, done that. Pitch correction, we've done that. Now let's get into the VFS. So VFS again, volume, frequency, stereo. In the volume here, I've got these two compressors and I know there's a lot of uh, jokes about CLA vocals. I don't use CLA vocals. I just use normal CLA, um, 2A and 3A, so which, are, which are- <laughs> You're getting so defensive. <laughs> <laughs> we had this whole conversation like right before <laughs> CLA vocals is like this uh, joke plugin that people make fun of uh, all the time CLA is the is the initials of a really famous mix engineer named Chris Chris Lord Algae I think that's how you pronounce his name and he he did like Green Day and all these other records but he's got this line of 
plugins called CLA with Waves. This compressor emulates the old Tektronix um, modular compressor. And again, I don't want to get into too much detail. All this thing basically is, is an automated volume knob. It's just turning down the vocals when they get too loud. And what that does is it makes it much easier to mix. So what I'm going to do, I, I put in, I put two compressors in one after the other, just to make sure I'm, I'm really getting it consistent. I'm just going to turn on these compressors and you can watch them turn down the volume. So you see over here, there's a, there's basically a gauge that will activate every time her vocals are getting too loud. So let me just play this and, and you'll see it move here. Summer see this one? was hot. You held me in the easy breeze. We got so it just on. for illustration purposes, if I really crank this a lot, you're gonna hear her vocals are just gonna get like squashed. So let me just, just for fun, let me just crank this like all the way. Uh, See, it's just, it's just turning it down, which is, which is too much. Like that makes it sound weird. So I'll put it back to where it was somewhere around here. What the hell has got into Exactly, all the quiet stuff is clear. Exactly, because what you're doing is you're making everything sound the same volume. You're turning down the loud stuff so much that it's just it's just one consistent volume the whole time. So the quiet stuff gets really loud and the loud stuff gets really quiet and everything's on the same level. Uh, that's where your artistic kind of ear comes in because you don't want to compress it too much because then it just sounds like a computer or something something weird. Um, anyway, so that, that would be the V part of the VFS. Um, just compressing and getting the volume dynamic range in the same spot. Next thing we want to do is the F, which is the frequency. And in the frequency, what I've done is I've just put in a slight amount of equalization. What equalization does is it will boost or reduce certain parts of the frequencies to make them sound more pleasing. So if I play this, you'll hear Celsius vocals basically live in this frequency range. So I've turned that part up because that's where her voice is, is brightest and sounds more pleasing. Summer was right hot. You held me in the easy What I've also done is I've scooped out the 4,000 hertz range. And the reason I've done that is because the 4,000 hertz is where like human hearing is the most sensitive. Uh, that's what we're evolved to hear the most. So just by turning that down, you can make your vocals sound really smooth and you can make them sound uh, you can turn them up without making them sound harsh. It might be hard for that for you to tell the impact of this EQ through Zoom, just because of the recording, you know, uh, transmission capabilities of Zoom are just limited. But things like this make a big difference at the end, uh, and we'll talk about that. I've also put in something called a deesser, and what a deesser does is it's gonna get rid of the sibilance sibilance of the vocal. So if she's if she's singing like the word sun, the S on the sun is gonna be really harsh on the mix. So it's gonna be like sun. What the vocal deesser does is it'll take just that S part and it'll turn it down when it happens. So we'll see it happen here. Uh, here. So check this out. If we see it happen. Yeah. Summer was hot. All the highlights of this will turn it down. You held me in the easy breeze. We got it so on. Every time she said anything starting with the S, it turned it down. And that that's what that's like the little stuff that matters in the frequency when you're in the S part of the VFS. Or sorry, the F part. Uh, stuff like that is gonna stack. Lastly, I've put in um, something called a saturator. And what a saturator does, again, we're in the frequency part, um, is it will make the um, higher frequency range of your vocals just shimmer and, and, and stand out more. I don't want to get into like the theory of this because I feel like I'm going to lose everybody um, if I start talking about like harmonic saturation. But just know that this is just a tool in your toolkit that if your vocals are sounding, you know, a little muffled, 
You can put some saturation on there and it'll make them really sparkly. So let's listen to it now. Summer and if I crank the mix hot. here, you have really me in the easy breeze. We got it on. I hope that translated over Zoom. Um, but these are some things that you can just mess around with when you're doing the VFS in the frequency part. Just be like, yeah, you know, maybe I'll crank it a little bit, or maybe I'll turn it down a little bit, depending on the track. One thing I do want to mention, though, right now we're doing everything soloed. If I was doing a real mix down, I would never do it like this. I would turn everything on and listen to it with respect to all the other rec all the other parts of your song. Because again, coming back to the first slide, you're trying to mix everything together so that it sounds good together. It doesn't matter how it sounds good soloed. It, it needs to sound good when it's all fit together. And the last part of this is the is the stereo or effects. What I've done here is I've sent this out to uh, a bus, which uh, we don't have to get into what busing is. Basically, it's adding some reverberation, stereo reverberation to the song. So it sounds like she's in like a giant room and there's like, uh, you know, like if you're ever singing in like a marble room or like a auditorium and your voice is carrying. Uh, what I'll do is I'll turn this off and I'll turn it back on just to show you. Summer so that's completely dry. Hot. And you held me in the easy breeze. We got it on. What? So we've just blown it up in the stereo realm and you can you can hear it. It's no longer just in the middle. It's got some trails on the side and it's making the vocal sound uh, uh, easier to place onto the record. Now we can spend like days just looking at you know different tweaks and different plugins and things like that I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions but um, after the class or you know just just message me I, I'd, I'd be glad to answer some of those things for you one thing I did want to show is just the visualization of stereo versus mono if I can get this smaller so over here if I play Celsius vocals you're gonna hear them you're gonna, you should be able to see them as, um, I'm not sure if any of these have stereo things, but it should be a vertical line. Summer so it's, was it's right hot. down the middle. You held me in the so easy if you remember from, our, from our graph, the vocal's right in the middle, smack dab in the middle, right? That's kind of, it's visualizing this. But if I turn on the reverb, you'll see it kind of open up like this. So here, here we go. Uh, where did Summer now let's turn it on. was hot. You yes. held me in the easy breeze. We got it on. What the hell has got into me? So that's just a quick demonstration on the S part which is the stereo part. So by adding those effects, I've, I've broadened it out from the mono, slightly thicker. It's gonna occupy slightly more space um, in your mix, which is, which is just pleasing to the ear. Yeah, just a comment here by, um, oh, Cameron's asking, how does a bus differ from reverb? This is reverb, this is a reverb bus. Uh, a bus just allows me to use the same reverb on multiple instruments. So I can have all the vocals have the same kind of reverb, which is some sometimes a, a great thing so that they don't fight each other. Uh, BZ just wanted to say something. Go ahead, you can, you can say it on the mic if you'd like. Oh, I, I was just gonna, cause I didn't want to cut you off, but I just wanted to help, like just so you didn't get uh, lost. Uh, it's just, yeah, like you said, it's just instead of putting it, it, I find it just helps with processing power instead of putting the same plug in like let's say you want to use the same reverb on multiple vocal tracks instead of like having to go in and like fine tune every single one let's say you have six vocal harmonies you want them all have the same reverb you just use a bus and then that bus basically distributes to every single uh, track that you want to assign it to and then you can individually mix them if you want to show them the little knobs there next to bus two and three those those knobs correspond to how how mixed the reverb gets yeah, it's yeah. like send and returns, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's like a send track. And Ibrahim, yeah, th so this is the main vocal, right? So remember, we don't want to make this one wide. We want it to be relatively 
mono, mostly mono, right in your face, uh, quite compressed, like I compress this quite a lot, and just smack dab in the middle. Now, let's get into uh, the background vocals or the backing vocals. So we got we got the main vocals done. They sound good. And let's, let's try to add some backing vocals. So over here, what I'm going to do is let's look at the chorus element in this track. And I'm going to I'm going to play the three vocal layers that I've got going on. Sun. Sun. So if you guys remember the um, the graph again, you've got the main vocals and you've got the side backing vocals, two of them. That's exactly what I'm doing here. So I got the main vocals, is just Celsi singing. Sun. Right in the middle, bottom. Sun. And then I've got this backing harmony going on. Backing harmony, again, it's, it's VFS, but it's way less like intensive. Like, um, for this particular harmony, what I did is I used, um, it's just, it's just a, I didn't compress it as much. I didn't, um, because it's not right in the middle. So I, I put one compressor. I didn't really put much equalization, but I, but I tried to follow the same thing. So this technically should be up here, but I've got the, um, again, getting rid of the low end. Then I went into auto-tuning it if I need to. Then I went into uh, VFS, which is volume, frequency, stereo. Uh, compression, didn't really do much on the frequencies, and then stereo. So if we listen to this, I'll, I'll just um, play it here. Sun, ooh, sun, ooh, ooh, and if I put that on top of the main vocals, it sounds like this. Sun, now, if I put them, um, actually, before I mention that, let me let me show you this sample delay. What this sample delay is doing is called the Haas effect. And the Haas effect in vocals, uh, if you guys are wearing headphones, you'll be able to tell, is it will take anything that's mono stereo in the middle uh, sorry mono in the middle and it'll just put it at the ends of the stereo just like way wide to ex to show you this what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn it on and off so this is this is off right now so it should sound right in the middle sun and i'll turn it on now sun sun i'm not sure if you were able to tell um, through stereo, um, through oh, you zoom. Could hear, you, could, you could hear, you could hear. It was very, you could hear it? I mean, at least yeah. for me, it was very clear, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's like a really good trick to take one take and, and bust it out on the side. That's what I did. I took this harmonic layer, this harmony layer, put it on the side, stamped it on top of Celsius vocals. So it's, it's so together it's sounding mm -hmm. proper. So Another thing I did on top of that is I added a third harmony layer, which was just sitting right underneath Celsius vocals um, really quietly. Sun, ooh, this one's mono. Sun, and if I play them together, sun, ooh, sun, Does anybody have any questions on that harmony, like harmonic harmony part? Oh, there's some questions in the chat here. You can also record the stereo microphone and get real stereo effects. Yes, you can. If you've got two microphones, you literally just put them at two different distances from the mic, uh, from the singer, and pan one to the left, pan one to the right, and you've got you've got that natural stereo effect. Uh, most people won't have that. <laughs> Most people won't have the, that many microphones just sitting around. If you can do it, like that's how they do it in 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 professional recording studios often. Uh, did you? I had a quick question about the wide harmony. There was that formented down, the uh, the second one. This one? No, this one's not formented. This one's just standard. Um, 
just the wait can you solo for a second i just wanted to hear because it sounded like almost i don't know i don't sure. know maybe no, i was no, just all good oh okay it was probably just a high pass maybe i don't know i just wanted to, it sounded a bit like uh like in a good way it sounded like um i don't know i don't know how to explain yeah. it but it's almost sounded formatted in a way like slightly. yeah you can i mean like um it, it's it's there's so much you can do with it and I, i'm just kind of ex explaining just the approach so you're gonna do the vfs mm -hmm. and anything you want to add you can add add that the F or you can format shift it do whatever you need um, to make them fit together and just be mindful of that graph that i was showing you with the vocals in the middle backing vocals left and right uh different parts of the frequencies that's really your roadmap for mixing because if you start mixing without really thinking of it that way everything's gonna be on top everything's gonna sound like muddy um sure, yeah for sure so i know that was really quick just going through i mean i could literally speak about every part of it but i'm not sure if that would be very useful um <laughs> but that brings us to the end of the vocal mixing um part of this class i, I was i hope that was useful and um any other questions you may have I, i'm open to taking to, to taking those questions on this project before we close this project and we can wrap up the class sure i'll jump in with a question sure um so not you mentioned that when you are going through this you're playing like you know all the different tracks all at once like do you first focus i guess then on like the main vocals as like your anchor and then like kind of make everything relative around that like you know what i mean yeah you well that's a great point um i you definitely can in this particular record i don't think we did it that way i think in this particular record uh the drums and the roads piano came first so all that stuff was done and then the vocals came in after that so this particular record was taken a little unconventionally but traditionally what would happen is you would have a songwriter that wrote a song they come into the studio everything's written and you're recording it so in that case yes you would try to make sure that the vocals have a spot an empty spot right in the middle and you would you would place them there and then you would kind of decorate around it it's like it's like a, it's like a painting right like you need to have a beautiful vocalist or a beautiful subject in your painting and then the background everything around it is what you're going to paint around it well love the painting analogies <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm glad that stuck um got a got another question here amr deep is saying can you show us oh. is that me no that's someone else uh, uh good. Can you mute? Good. yeah so just um looking at this here how do you go left and right how do you put pieces left and right so it can it can literally be as easy as there's this pan right here and you can put them left so i can pan left or i can pan right um let's say just to give you a quick example i've got um what if i panned yeah, okay. So I've got this uh I've got this tableau layer. I'll play it for you. Right? It's just playing in the background. Now if I pan it, let me just pan it. So now it's on the left. It should be over zoom should be on the left. Or I can put it on the right. Right? I mean the functionality also changes depending on the DAW, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure Ableton has its so own knob that you can turn or pro tools you know they've got their own ways to do it um that's one easy way to pan you can also use uh what i what i showed with the haas effect um i didn't want to go into too much detail on the haas effect because it's just like this niche thing but um that's another good way to pan um or to just create a stereo effect i hope that answers the question there was there sidechain compression on the roads? Which instruments do you usually sidechain when you use it? Great observation. Yes, there was sidechain compression on the roads. I didn't want to get into 
super detailed sidechain compression um, talk, but what what sidechain compression is, is it's basically that automated volume knob, instead of it turning things down when things get too loud, what it does is it turns things down when you tell it to turn it down. So what I've done is I've basically told it to turn it down every single time the kick kicks in because I want my kick to be really audible. So if I play it, um, this compressor, I believe this is the compressor that I used. What you'll see is every time the kick happens, it's going to turn it down. So here, let's just play it. piano and and you hear it with the side chain you'll just hear the piano being turned down every every beat so here let me play it you hear that it's like... and what's that it's allows a, yeah yeah go ahead i was just gonna say it's a great technique to give like sort of movement to pianos too like it's just it, it gives it like almost like a bouncy feel but obviously if you overdo it it's just like kind of a, like it's it's either you need to find that sweet spot but it definitely adds like a nice balance to it yeah exactly exactly so uh it's a stylistic choice in in this example it is a stylistic choice like i like that movement in the piano however it can also just be um, a mix thing like it just helps it, it it helps your kick come through the mix because alternatively you'd have to like turn the kick louder and louder and louder and louder and then suddenly you've got other problems the kick's too loud and the whole track is too loud and things like that so i hope that i hope that answers the question there ibrahim that was ibrahim's question right uh, yeah did oh, you no, uh Adian. Adian. did you also side chain your kick in your bass yes i did okay. <laughs> so i definitely did but this one the way I did it is I actually punched it directly into the kick. Oops. What do you so mean? So you see, or sorry, punch it directly into the bass. Oh, okay. So this bass here, if you listen to it, it's already already got those gaps for the kicks. Right. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Yeah. So I, I it's just directly in in the bass line itself. Um, for some people that might be confused, see what's happening is here. Let me let me put them side by side. This is the kick, and this is the bass line. See, every time the kick hits, there's no bass. <laughs> like, quite literally, like, the bass is just silent when the kick is coming in. So it's like, boom, sh, boom, sh, boom, sh, boom. Sh. If I play them together, um, let's hear. Did you hear that? Oh, so clean. Oh. <laughs> so clean. So that's, the bass that's gonna... sounds a lot sorry to interrupt the bass sounds a lot crunchier when you have it soloed it when you have all the other tracks enabled it all sounds like a lot smoother but just on its own i'm noticing like this really high frequency like i'm wondering if uh it's just like we're not hearing it or noticing it when everything else is there or maybe there's like a sneaky effect that you turn on uh <laughs> there's no sneaky effect um that is just how it comes across let me play now that you've heard the bass by itself let me play the track that part total and then i'll tell you why the bass sounds like this so let's just solo it so we can't hear the crunchiness on the sorry go ahead someone was saying something Oh, I was just saying, it's almost like beneficial muddiness. Yeah. Like, almost. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, kind of. Well, like, but like, no, but like, not, you know what I mean? Like, it's covering up those high, but like, in a good way. That's why I don't think it was an issue. Yeah, yeah. It, it's basically what I've done here is I want the track, and this is getting out of the realm of like vocal mixing and obviously like just classic mixing. What I did here is I put a lot of that harmonic saturation, the S part, like the FS. I put a lot of, or sorry, no, the F part, the frequency part. I put a lot of harmonic saturation because I wanted this bass to be audible on any speaker. 
the issue is is like if if i just put in just the low end on this bass you wouldn't be able to hear it on like a phone you wouldn't be able to hear it on your laptop you wouldn't be able to hear it on like you know small headphones so by adding that grittiness yeah you can't hear it in the full mix but if you played it on like a cell phone speaker you'd be able to hear the bass now which is which is where you want it to be i hope that answers the question yeah, geez, I didn't even consider that. That's something I've always been struggling with is getting my bass to be audible. Like, I, it sounds fine on my speakers, but then on my headphones, it's like, eh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's where that's where the in, in the frequency part of the VFS, in the frequency part, you want to be like, okay, I'm going to put harmonic or saturation content in there so that the smaller speakers that aren't, like, it's not like a 10,000 watt PA system on stage, an ultra music festival, you know, you don't need like giant bass driven speakers to be able to hear this bass anymore. Anybody you can, you can hear on any speaker. And and that's getting into mastering as well, which which I I don't think we have the time to get into like this entire chain on the master channel, but um, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about it another time. Here's another question. Um, can we hear the whole track again? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, it's coming out soon. Um, I'm, I can I can play it again uh, later if you'd like. Um, there's something going on with the vocals uh, and the instruments like the reverbs are mixing and creating this warmth it's crazy i see why can... oh thank you thanks so much um subtly ringing in the back yeah question here what is the loudest element in this track and why i love that question um in 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 the pop music genre you want the vocals to be the loudest element of the track. One tip that I learned from this uh, Emmy Award winning or Emmy Award nominated music uh, composer, this is the trick he told me. He said, if you want to know what the loudest element of your track is, turn the whole track down, like literally with your, with your hands, turn down your interface to zero, play the track, and then slowly turn it up and listen to the first thing that you can hear. The first thing that is audible to you is the loudest part of the track. In a track like this, I would want the vocals and the drums to kind of be the same loudness. Because this isn't really like a full on like pop um, record. It's more like an R&B style record. So I'd want them to be balanced um, and, and come in together. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Divine Pop. Yeah, there you go. So Divine Pop. <laughs> okay, and another question here. Is distortion and saturation different? Uh, it's, it's similar. Distortion is basically like a lot, so much saturation that it's like destroying the sound, but it's destroying it in like a meaningful, controlled way. Um, it usually it's based on the same principles there are some like funky things called clip distortion there's things called bit uh bit crushing distortion which are slightly different because that's like distorting the actual quality of the record um i can send you some articles on that stuff but it's it's getting the same um same thing across and that vfs it's doing the f part like those are some tools in your f uh category right um and, and I don't see any other questions, but um, I just wanted to say, like, I hope that this exercise was useful in just um, illustrating some of the things we talked about in the actual PowerPoint presentation, which is that VFS, like that entire chart, where are different things and why you're deliberately placing them in different spots. If you start to look at your mixing from that lens, it's just going to make things so much easier because you're no longer going to be like, trying to fight this battle of what's what do i crank what do i turn down like if you ever see if you ever hear things that are like um giving you problems just go back okay did i do the vfs is there just like a dog in the background of this recording that's throwing it off is there like is is the vocalist just off tune right like try to try to approach it from that lens and, and i guarantee you um it will help um perfect so what 
Sorry, so yeah so i mean everyone uh i just wanted to say like let's let's get all our questions out because i i don't want to keep nanak here just like you know indefinitely so what I, I was thinking with your it's up to you i mean everyone here seems to be wanting to hear and i quote can we vibe one last time <laughs> so uh sure. so what we could do is send out all your questions now we'll get them we'll go through them and then this way he can end on like a bang where he just like plays it and then and then we're Good. done. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, how do you know when you've added too much? It's really a stylistic choice. In my opinion, like this, this record has 36 layers in it, which is, in my opinion, a good spot. A lot of people would say that's like nowhere near enough. A lot of records have like a hundred plus layers to them. Um, I've found that the more layers you add, it's, it's a double edged sword because you know that that graph that we're that that we showed you the frequency is 20 to 20k that's all you have and the more stuff you're putting the more overlap you're going to have and the harder it is to mix and usually it doesn't sound that great so yeah exactly like lo-fi you can get away with 10 layers and some of the other records you might need um like this record 36 and it's to me this sounds like enough you can use this free plugin called voxengo span highly recommend it um, this will show you your entire 20 to 20k spectrum and it does it in a very balanced way and it shows you like how loud everything is in comparison to everything else so it's good to have this up like if I play the record with this on which I will um, at the end here you'll see that things are relatively on the same horizontal which is a good way to tell okay probably enough <laughs> there's no real holes um, that I need to fill Question here, if we're adding a synth on the left and right, do we copy it twice and then pan one to the left and pan one to the right? Um, you definitely can. However, if they're the exact same synth on the left and the right, it's just gonna be mono again. They have to be slightly different. Um, that's where you can use, If I don't know if you use Logic, but if you have something like that, you can actually use within Logic, there's a lot of uh, stereo plugins that are built in, like this spreader plugin. This spreader plugin will just give you stereo spread. Like you don't even have to think about it too much. Or you can use, um, there's another effects uh, imaging, stereo spread. So this is a great plugin. What this does is L, R, left and right, and then the frequencies, and it'll literally just spread it for you. So you can say, okay, I want these frequencies to be spread about like that. So this is like a really good way to just spread, stereo spread. I that plugin is goaded. Very good yeah, plugin. I, it's, it. in, I call it insta wide because it just makes everything instant wide. Exactly. <laughs> Instantly wide. Yeah, I, I hope that answers um, that question, Amardeep. Um, next, sorry, I, go ahead. I just had a quick question for you. I just wanted to bring up something. Um, have you encountered phasing issues when you layer identical audio for example like voices like 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 a lot of people will say don't layer vocal tracks identical identically like literally copy paste and, and layer them on top because you will get phasing issues i was asking i was just gonna ask if you've encountered that yeah so if you get like completely identical things on top um that's usually bad usually unless you're doing it stylistically um, because you're gonna get, you're gonna start just facing like issues and artifacts in your in your mix. I know I'm being vague here, but if you're if you're ever stacking exactly the same thing, try to distort one of them by a little bit, just so it's not like exactly the same, or like time stretch it just a little bit, just so not like exactly the same, because you're gonna start getting like weird sounding things happening in your mix um, that you probably don't want. <laughs> Or you can use, if you have ways, you can use, another good way to do it um, is this doubler plugin um, here. This doubler plugin is really good because it'll just give you one, two, three, four takes uh, and you can just like, you know, put them on different parts. Okay, I put this one here, I put this one, you know, here. Like it'll just allow you to like basically create your own and then the main main ones there. So it'll just allow you to create your own kind of double take. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, for sure. Great. 
Um, question here, Ar Ariana. Um, in some cases, your tracks like Thoroughflex, you have this clean base that I'm sure you work with a lot of saturation, EQing. How important to you is doing something as drastic, having your 808 sit a few dB louder than other elements in the mix down? That's a great question. And that gets into, that gets into like overall mastering. What I tend to do is I will do my mix down really, really heavy on the bass. And then when I get to mastering, what I'll do is I'll turn down the bass on the EQ, compress it, and then turn up the bass again. And that's like a sneaky little trick to make sure that your bass is just like pounding without, um, without screwing up the rest of your track. I think I did it on this record. Yeah, so here we go. So I'm, I'm getting into the mastering elements of it now, but I, I turned down the bass, I turned up the treble here, and then I'm pretty sure I compressed it, and then I don't know if I, yeah, in this particular one, I don't think I did that. Maybe I did it here. Yeah, and then I turned up the bass again. So that, that might be a good, I know I, I just kind of like blasted through that. Uh, but I hope that answers the question because, yeah, it is important that you do have your bass sit loud enough that when it hits um, your mastering chain, it's it's not like triggering everything in your mastering chain. Because if your bass is too loud, it's the, it's, it's the highest energy part of your mix. So the bass is going to start triggering all your master compressors, is going to start triggering all of your noise gates, all that stuff on your on, at the end. So you want to make sure that it's sitting... Um, that you're mastering it right. I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure if that actually answered your question. Okay, I'm, I'm guessing it did then. I'll just continue going on here. The Windows boys are crying. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I guess logic is, logic is the goat for real. Um, okay. This is the last question that I'll probably take. Should you really have only one main vocal track in the playlist? I have personally encountered phasing issues myself when stacking layers while trying to achieve things like parallel compression. For example, one track is heavily compressed and quiet uh, while the other is minimally compressed to give more body to the vocal. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. You, you, can, um, you can definitely do that. It's... It, like when you're getting into parallel compression and things like that like they'll have such a minimal impact on your mix that um if you do the vfs right like you probably shouldn't even have to get into like parallel like that level of like nitty gritty if you do it right you should just be able to use like a simple compressor um couple stacked layers like this track doesn't have that much going on like it's got you know three vocal layers max um not that many layers overall like 36 but then out of those 36 like one two three four five are buses so it's really only like around 30 layers right so just just keep in mind like if you're if you're having to do that much surgery on it it's probably just like something else in your vfs is wrong like maybe your v part is just wrong like maybe you just didn't even gain stage it right you know so and i think that that's a great point to to just conclude uh conclude the questions there um i know we've gone a little bit over but thank you everyone for coming i i really appreciate it i i hope this provided some kind of value i hope this was useful um i hope this gave you guys at least like an approach on okay i'm mixing something what do i what should i do how should i start um i think that's the that's what i want to get across here I'm, I'm happy to, you know, DM me on Instagram or, or shoot me an email. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any other questions um, here for the QWAVE community. And, and thank you. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Manak. It. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I think everyone will agree with me when I say that that song slaps and we can't wait for it to come out. Oh, um, my God. Don't even. <laughs> um <laughs> but uh yeah, yeah so i mean <laughs> absolutely yeah, so great. it's gonna be coming out march 9th um I, I don't know if you have anything else to say 
Adam, but if we're good to go, I'll just play the record and, and we should be good. I, th I think, honestly, the only thing I want to say is that I know we were talking about a lot of technicalities today, but and and, and I think it is very important to, to tune yourself to certain, you know, um, ideas and certain, you know, traditions that you should you should establish within yourself i mean every producer has their own uh process but above all else remember that music at the core of it is subjective um and you got to just listen to it and i'm a firm believer in the fact that if something sounds good 99 percent of the time it is good and i mean i you know, I also consider myself a perfectionist, so I real I will dig into a track and make sure that everything is fine. But again, just at the end of the day, if it sounds good to you, that's that's the whole point of art, right? Is to create what we enjoy and what we can, uh, you know, put out there and for others to enjoy also. So yeah, I mean, uh, let's let's listen to this bop. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I'll I'll play this and I'll I'll keep the span on the whole time, so you'll be able to see all the different frequencies and how they're interacting with each other. So let's check it out. Thank you all for coming. Nanak, thank you for stopping by and uh yeah, claps all around. Snaps, snaps. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, uh that ends that.